Mic check one, two. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 438. That's 438 of the Agostino Zynga Show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing, good to hear. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. You know what to do. Smash that like button, hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. If you find anything interesting and you want to share your thoughts and opinions, please do so in the comment section. And if you want to support the show and you're listening via the podcast app, please make sure you leave me a five-star review, download it and share it with your family and friends. And then of course, support via Patreon is always more than welcome via the Patreon at patreon.com for just Agostino. You get my bonus show on there, some unfiltered, politically incorrect opinions and views from me and myself stuff that i'm not that comfortable uploading on youtube get, gets put precisely or gets put exactly or gets put or gets loaded doesn't get up gets put gets uploaded um directly on patreon so make sure you join patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for just a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o to get the agostino bonus show on there don't delay get involved today it's only one dollar it's equivalent of one pound something get involved there low tier start there you get access to all my archive as well as the bonus show so get involved don't delay get involved today Anyways, how are you guys doing? How are you feeling? Hope you're well wherever you are. Um, I know I am, just about getting there. What's been occurring? Nothing much in it. Same old. We're just always putting one foot in front of the other and ensuring that we're carrying on and living to fight another day. That is the name of the game, right? Name of the game. Um, obviously, things have improved drastically in the UK. We obviously have some light in the tunnel. We're eagerly anticipating when we're able to go outdoors and enjoy ourselves and hang out with friends see family members eat at restaurants drink in pubs and bars go to football stadiums dancing clubs bloody blah 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 the end is near the end is near but what i'm doing in between that time oh um i just watched man city beat wolves 4-1 um, before I tuned in, I think I just tuned in just after half time and it was 1 1. And then suddenly I just turned it off when they scored 2 1. And at the end of the game, it was 4 1. And um, it's kind of frustrating, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Being a Man United fan and seeing Man City absolutely trounce in the league um, at will, right, with, with hardly breaking a sweat, really um, puts into perspective just how far behind we are as a club. Um, Fair enough, right? They're playing great football and all that stuff, but infrastructure wise, right? In terms of like where we want to be as a football club, what we're trying to aim towards, um, what the goals are, the players we want to develop, the brand of football we want to play, the sort of coaches we want managing the club, we just don't have a clue. Um, and I think a lot of my United fans haven't necessarily woken up to the fact that this is pretty bleak stuff from us especially in comparison to what's going on in around us, right? We're not even set up in a way where we can compete with clubs like Man City. And I'm talking about infrastructure. I'm talking about the people above the manager, boardroom level, clubs level. You know, Old Trafford needs a bit of a revamp as well, right? That 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 stadium, I'm pretty sure we don't even have a TV, a screen there, right? It's, it's a bit mad. So um, things need to change, obviously. And it just seems as if that there's no change on the horizon because by and large from what it seems like according to our results and our previous league positions more likely than not we're probably going to finish second or third this season right uh barring a cat catastrophic you know fall from grace we're definitely going to finish in the top four so if that's the case and you consider what the Glazers did previously with other managers, more than likely, Solskjaer will get to keep his job. We'll get given a bit more money in the summer to spend again. Maybe not a lot Maybe not a lot of money because what we know about the Glazers, we, they only spend more money than they have to when we don't get in a Champions League because the Champions League equals less money in their pocket, less sponsorship, all that sort of stuff, brand deals. So they usually um skirt away or kind of you know refuse to spend as much if we do qualify for the champions league which is backwards thinking really because you'd imagine the more money you spend into the team the more successful we are in a consistent basis the less you'll have to basically outlay into transfers all the time right it kind of goes back to Sykes Ferguson he did spend a lot but he usually spent it on like names that he thought could kind of transform the team and take a certain level above it wasn't signing 11 players all, like, all in one window he had a good spine a good core of a team and then he kind of you know added added here and there with some you know undercover buys with a couple youth team players with maybe a couple of players out over the hill quote unquote some experience but it was never like wholesale changes and we could easily do that if we were serious but again 
Are we really trying to win the league? Are we really trying to win the Champions League? I don't think so. I think we're just here to make up the numbers. From what I see so far, in terms of intent, because what Man City are doing, the ruthless efficiency, the ruthless efficiency at which they operate at, especially now, considering how much they've won, it's just scary. And it just seems like what they're heading towards is they want to get to a, a position where they are in... They, well, they have a chance to win the Champions League, which is the crown jewel, right, on that project. And you expect, you know, if they win the Champions League, more likely than not, Pep Guardiola will probably move on to something else. But they really want to win the Champions League. They want to, you know, they've got league dominance. Uh, they've won the league trophies numerous times. Um, they've obviously snatched this tro this Premier League trophy probably away from Liverpool, uh, barring a complete, you know, turnaround of events. The Champions League is still the one thing that kind of is out of their, you know, so far been out of their reach. But so far, comparing how other teams, the bigger teams in Europe are playing, it's just looking I'm a bit ominous, man. Ominous, 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 whatever that term is. It's just, it's just like I said, it's just annoying, isn't it? I've come to, I've come, I've come, um, I'm at peace with it a little bit because, you know, football, especially decisions on this kind of scale are far outside of my pay grade. I don't have in, no influence, zero, none, zilch. Neither does the fan base. We can holler and scream about the owners. Nothing changes. Holler and scream about change, about transfer budgets and about player recruitment. Nothing changes. Holler and scream about players. Nothing changes. Holler and scream about the managers. Nothing changes. So it is quite annoying. It's sort of like screaming into the void, but I guess that's part of a football fan's purview and journey in it you're always sort of screaming into the void nothing is ever really saw it until it is it's always just a bit of a mind fuck in that regard but hey what can you do what can you do in it um jam pack show for you today loads of stuff to get involved in and talk about so make sure you grab yourself a little beverage or snack whatever you need to keep yourself going we're gonna get involved we're gonna get dive on deep to the show yeah let's dive on deep dive on deep dive on deep so number one Number one topic I want to get into, something that's very, very close to my heart, of course, um, assuming that everything opens up as need be, um, is that I want to advocate for Sasha Lord, the nighttime advisor for Manchester, to get a knighthood of some sort. When everything is settled and all the dust, uh, you know, when the dust is settled and, uh, you know, and the empty pints of beer glasses have been placed on the table, and slotted into the washing machine and people are trotting back home and getting their kebab when everything is sorted and everyone's had a really good time and they've kind of got all the going out system they've got they've got the kind of going out uh, thing out of their system and people have sobered up and they want to kind of look at who kind of you know had a positive impact during this whole covid lockdown supporting small businesses supporting you know industries and especially or supporting businesses especially in the hospitality sector such a lord is definitely somebody that um that definitely deserves some recognition and some acknowledgement from the government, you know, whatever it may be, knighthood, a position, something, a, a bump in raise, whatever it may be, he definitely deserves it because he's been fighting a good fight. So much so that he's kind of really shown up. Um, Amy Lammy, the supposed nighttime advisor we have here in London, who for what I can see so far has done pretty much jack shit instead of giving those like awkward smile things that she does to the camera like, I don't, I don't know what else she's actually done. But Sasha Lord is basically proving what a nighttime uh, advisor is meant to be doing. And again, all of this stuff that Sasha Lord has been doing in terms of advocating for hospitality industry has been uh, mostly focused on the entire hospitality industry across the, the whole UK, not just specifically for Greater Manchester, where he resides and where he's from. No, he's looking after everybody. And this really selfless and amazing work has not gotten a notice from me. So this is a quote from him. Um, just the other day, it says, on the back of yesterday's news in getting a substantial meal and a high court ruling, we are back again. Hospitality should open at the same time as non-essential retail on the 12th of April. We are more regulated, licensed and put more measures, uh, safety measures, I guess, in place. And this is obviously uh, relating to the government mandate that has um, laid out in the roadmap where essentially non-essential retail, you know, re um, clothing stores and whatnot will open before pubs and bars are allowed to have people sitting indoors and drinking and eating which is obviously batshit crazy it makes no complete sense in the beginning of lockdown especially he was very skeptical about the science and the data that was being used to justify bars and pubs closing there was a lot of data coming out showing that you know i think when i remember the height even of the virus 
I think only 5% of cases were accounted for hospitality industry, right? 5%. It makes sense. And if you've ever been to, especially if you live in the UK, if you've been to a pub or a bar in London or in the UK, mostly um, during lockdown or during COVID actually times, you would have known that most of these places put up, you know, crazy amounts of um, safety measures to ensure that the patrons were safe because, you know, they were losing money day in, day out. So whatever money they could get back from however many people were coming in, they would do it. So they were going above and beyond to make sure that happened. Some places were even doing it out of their own pocket, right? They weren't supplied with any PPE, nothing. So they did all that needed to be done. And still the government went out of their way to, um, you know, shutter that entire industry and ruin people's lives and careers, like loads of madness. Anyway, that's what was one of the bridge now we've moved on. But Sash Lord was definitely one of the main people that, you know, he was definitely the main people because he ended up taking the government to court and he basically was able to win um over the ruling that kind of advised that we you know when pubs reopened they needed to have uh, substantial meals just by people sitting indoors really batshit crazy shit and now he's kind of pushing forward again and not taking his foot off the pedal and pushing for hospitality industry to open on the 12th of april alongside all northern central retail now it's a bit of a stretch goal it's probably a bit of a long shot might not probably it probably no, it might not happen it's unlikely to happen but still the pressure is needed to be put onto the government in order to kind of justify every single thing that they're doing because what we can't be doing is just letting them do it's just letting them this it's letting them kind of run ragged and just do what they want because we've seen what happened prior right last year especially during the peak that like the government didn't have a clue right so one moment it was softly softly hands off next moment it's draconian laws the next moment it's a five-day break in between the next moment it isn't like really loads of differing right loads of dilly dallying and that's probably one of um one of uh boris johnson's shortcomings in that regard right when he does take a decision it always comes weeks if not days after it should have been done prior um without the clarity loads of leaks to the media just loads of annoying stuff so this is Sasha Lord talking about it on the times radio play it for you now you know, they are licensed, they are regulated. So why is it right that on the 12th of April, you can drive into, into uh, the city centre, go in and out of all the shops, where there are hardly any measures whatsoever. You can go and have your hair cut. You can, you can fly into Sainsbury's, buy as much alcohol as you want. Um, but you cannot stop and sit down and eat a sandwich in somewhere like Pratt. It does not make any sense to me. So exactly. that is the next challenge. And what we're saying is, look, we put more measures in place than non-essential retail. We are licensed. We are regulated. So allow us to open up. It's exactly the same time on the 12th of April and not five weeks down the line because we don't think there is any evidence whatsoever. Definitely agree with the guy. And then um, he writ this or he put together this really good article as well, courtesy of The Independent, I'm going to say. I'm going to get it up on your screen for you as well to check out. So this is called, um, the I took the government to court over its COVID restrictions on pubs. This is why, from Sasha Lord, it says, Today we announce a landmark victory in um, the a landmark victory for the hospitality industry, and one I'm personally very proud of. As we wound up our court case following the judgment um, that the substantial mill restriction imposed on wet lead pubs was arguably discriminatory towards certain sects of society. As such, this ruling made February 5th forced the government to U-turn on restrictions in their roadmap announcement last week. When we kicked off our legal case um, last year, we wanted to shine a light on the unfairness of the restrictions on the sector and discuss the legality around forcing wet lead pubs to remain shut while those which um, serve food can reopen. As a nighttime economy advisor for Greater Manchester, I know that venues across our region serve a multitude of communities, all different in our in our own ways, that wet lead pubs and social clubs in particular hold a significant place in building these communities, especially within the, our most uh, deprived areas. In Manchester alone, there are 1,809 wet lead pubs and bars which were not allowed to reopen when the region moved into tier 3 in December. Yeah, I remember that, man. That was such a catastrophe. And the mill restriction was imposed, condemning them to the almost uncertain administration and bankruptcy. Um, the decision to punish these venues while keeping um, others open was a blow to our northern culture. And if I remember correctly, one of Matt Hancock's friends' districts um, was allowed to move into tier 2 and have their places open, even though they had the same numbers as Manchester 
there are some real scummy stuff happening hopefully people remember this when the next elections come up right don't don't forget all these sort of things um the decision to punish the venues da, da, da. the measures clearly discriminated against unfairly impacted on the poorest and most disadvantaged in our region as oliver wright the partner of the law firm jw jmw solicitors who represented me said this case highlighted the lack of real scientific evidence to support the government's policy and their failure to understand that this discriminatory effects on non-white and BAME communities. Um, and although uh, many of these venues have suffered and unfortunately many have succumbed to the financial pressures of COVID, I am personally pleased with the judgments made in our case. We have given hope to those clinging on, not just from the businesses, but the customers most affected as we head towards the end of the crisis. While the safety of our residents across the region is our utmost priority, it is my role to ensure that there is ongoing support for all those who are suffering, whether it be financially or on a societal point of view. As such, our job is not done and will continue to work with those most affected across the nighttime economy, hospitality sector to ensure all measures imposed on the industry going forward are fair to everyone absolutely amazing we have seen um now that the measures which are not based on scientific data can be questioned and my legal team and i are already in discussions regarding the lack of evidence to justify the delay of reopening the indoor vitality compared to non-essential retail um as the people who know this sector best we urge the government again to work with us on decisions and plan to reinvest these kinds of u-turns and monitor toll taken on the business owner just by making a living though sorry to, pre to prevent these kinds of u-turns and mental tolls taken on the living the, the, and we're all working in the same end goal to help as many businesses survive the pandemic as possible now there's a real opportunity to move forward such lots of nighttime economy um, advisor for Grange Manchester and co-founder of Park Life and the Warehouse Project. Such Lord will donate all the court cases recovered from the secretary evenly between Hospitality Action and Greater Manchester Mayor's Charity. How amazing, man. The guy deserves a flipping knighthood, honestly, for, for real. And again, look at the flipping, um, the the difference in approach between him and Amy Lammy. This is such an embarrassment too, right? Um, what is, great, is Greater Manchester, UK's city, the UK's second most popular popular most populated city i think maybe this should be something amy lamy should be doing right she should be leading this forward um obviously it would be a great way to kind of mend the north south divide all this kind of stuff but again there she is twiddling her farms resting on her laurels collecting a check doing absolutely jack shit um and then kind of such a lot kind of stole the front and did all the lord's work and kind of helped out everybody going forward so definitely keep that in mind during the next elections i really wonder anyway going forward like what how long is amy lamy meant to be in power in her position she's felt like she's had that job forever is that i'm assuming that job is tied in directly with Sadiq khan and him being obviously the mayor um of london and he obviously is the one that hired her so i'm assuming if we get another mayor she'd have to vacate her position right i'm assuming so because she's been collecting a check for doing absolutely jack shit she took credit for the whole fabric thing which i don't really think had anything to do with her whatsoever it probably has to do more with the public outcry but so far she's done pretty much nothing to help or mend the nighttime economy and to support some of our you know um you know, uh underground uh places that are basically been affected negatively you know with the changes of the economy she's done really nothing she's really 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 terrible and again I, I, not to be one of those guys but like i've always had a bit of a funny I, I never really understood why somebody of her background you know was the person that was leading the charge in terms of looking after the nighttime economy especially when you consider the amount of the the fertile ground we have in london we have so many people involved in you know entertainment venues nightlife whatever it may be hospitality experts absolute killers in their field who could have done that job with their eyes closed and they weren't given it instead we gave it to this woman who like ugh, i don't know what is she a politician first is she really a nighttime advocate like what is she um is she american like the american thing is odd as well like well i'm assuming she's got a british citizenship which is why she's got a position but still it's so bizarre isn't it we just only london could do something like that and it's somebody that's not even from here who's not you know local from the area actually she has roots in this place knows what it's about is the one that's leading the charts night time coming it's just I, I don't know i find it odd i find it odd but hey what do i know next on the list talking about moving and talking about people opening things up and the world returning to some semblance of normality um 
I kind of envy the US approach. Again, it's a bit haphazard. It's probably going to cost more lives than it's going to save, unfortunately. But I guess, you know, Americans just have a completely different way of looking at the world than we do in, the U in Europe for the most part. They very much value their freedom of movement and expression and being able to kind of earn a living off their own dime, off the sweat of their own brow, off the, you know, hard work of their own hands, all this sort of malarkey. So the whole idea of staying indoors, wearing a mask for a long time, abiding by all these scientific rules especially when you include all the kind of you know crazy conspiracy stuff going on the politicization of the issue it was never going to be smooth sailing it was never going to be smooth sailing there was never going to be a sort of a collective acceptance of what to do and how to approach things right but i kind of like that chaos i think that chaos has basically helped certain states of course because they're governed individually of their own or they got yeah they're not they're governed separately individually whatever that term is so they don't need to kind of abide by any there's no sort of like you know um countrywide mandate that they kind of have to ascribe by so they can all take different approaches to how to do with covid that some places have opened up such as i think is it miami florida yeah some places have opened some places have closed some places have done like a u-turn and stuff they're doing in new york and now texas the home of all the new the home of all the comedians that have relocated from LA has now decided to open things up and just say, you know what, enough is enough. We're going to just go back to normal uh, because uh, this thing is, um, this lockdown is killing or is hindering us more than it's helping us. So this is courtesy of ABC 13 Eyewitness News. It said all Texas COVID-19 mandates lifted effective next Wednesday, government ever said. So imagine we have this really delayed, slow, methodical approach that's led by science, five weeks in between each tier or each kind of reopen of the roadmap bloody blah, blah 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 a very cautious approach which you can understand from Boris Johnson's point of view right he's really cocked it up the you know Tory government has not done a great job with COVID in the UK and they, they read the last thing they want is more bodies and more blood on their hands so they're trying their best to mitigate from that but the US are just like nah let's go man yeehaw baby let's open shit up so it continues here it says Austin, um, Texas is lifting its marks mandate. Governor Greg Abbott said on Tuesday, making it the largest state to end an order intended um, to prevent the spread of coronavirus, um, which killed more than 42,000 Texans. That's, that's not a minor. Um, the Republican governor has faced sharp criticism from his party over the mandate, which imposed eight months ago and other COVID-19 restrictions. It was only ever lightly enforced, even during the worst outbreaks of the pandemic. Yes, of what I've been reading online, people have been basically arguing that Texas has never never really abided or listened to any other kind of mandates obviously um when the governor puts in some rules um it means certain sectors of the industry can't open so maybe you can't go to certain bars or clubs or whatever but in terms of daily right in gyms and whatever is open at the moment people are just doing what they're doing no one's wearing masks no one's social distancing saying it is what it is um i think i remember seeing a video of uh, somebody recording um people in walmart or target or something in texas and people just walking around no mask you know just doing what they wanted to do so they kind of decided i guess as citizens to just be like you know what fuck this we're just gonna do what we want because um you know they just don't believe it's that big of an issue i guess um the continuity of texas will also do away with limits on the number of diners um that businesses can reserve serve indoors said abbott who made the announcement at a restaurant in lubbock he said the new rules would uh, come into effect on march 10th he said removing statewide mandates does not end personal responsibility speaking from the crowded dining room where many of the surrounded him were not wearing masks i love it but honestly i love the lawlessness i've loved the flipping independence the just going out there and just doing whatever you need to be done it's just mad isn't it and again the thing is interesting too none of the i would imagine a large percentage of citizens from texas aren't gonna blame him for doing this either right they're gonna be really they're gonna be if anything championing this because a lot of people want to reopen their businesses go back to normal life whatever it may be so they're definitely gonna welcome this it continues it's just that now state mandates are no longer needed he said the decision comes as governors across the u.s are being easing restrictions despite the warnings from health experts where the pandemic is far from over like most of the country texas has seen the number of cases and deaths plunge hospitalizations are the lowest level since october and the seven-day rolling average of positive tests has dropped to about 7,600 cases down from more than 10,000 mid-February. That's definitely something to celebrate. And again, this is the issue I have with mainstream media and some of the people that are like, you know, advocating for people to stay indoors forever. If the numbers keep going down and we have vaccines, and I guess in the US, I think they have just um if i'm not mistaken they're in their approval stages or testing whatever it may be for the johnson and johnson one which is going to be the game changer because that's that i think is a vaccine that doesn't require two uh doses so 
we're in a position now mostly apart from places you know in the eu unfortunately they're having a hell of a time but in most places you know in the uk north america we're in a position where we can effectively open up and get people you know back to living their normal lives and i think it's good i think it's a great thing it's a risk of course there is no safe um zero death way of reopening back the economy in no way shape or form but there needs to be especially now that we're kind of what 11 months or so into lockdown into living with this virus there needs to be some form of um normality restored whether that means you know unfortunately some risk needs to be taken it just is what it is unfortunately um continues only californians and new york have been reported more covid19 deaths than texas the fact that um, things are headed in the right direction doesn't mean that we have um succeeded in eradicating the risk said dr lauren myers Sorry, Lauren Ansel Meyer is a professional integr integrative biology and director of the University of Texas. She said that recent steadily winter in Texas had left millions without power, forced families to shelter closely and could amplify the transmission of the virus weeks ahead, although it remains too early. Masks, she said, are one of the most effective strategies. But that's the thing, though, man. If you've just survived that, right? If you nearly survived, um, you know, you and your family freezing in your own home, not having electricity or running water, you want to get back to work the last thing you want to be doing is staying indoors you know with a mask on as you rock your baby to sleep that's not a future that you want so again this thing is really exposed like you know when it comes to government and working with scientists and with these sort of like you know public health issues there just needs to be a balance that, that you can't just completely listen to the scientists and you can't just completely go off the reservation and just listen to the politicians you want to get things reopened so they can line their pockets or ensure that they get re-elected there has to be some balance but the idea that you should be listening completely to scientists in terms of public health issues is just ludicrous because you know the entire economy will collapse right because they would basically mandate you look you had some of the people coming out saying you should wear five masks or three or whatever it may be um zero covid strategy which you know especially in this or uh, well especially in western europe and parts of north america just isn't something that's going to be possible it's just you know we are where we are i think most of it has also been caused via our own negligence especially in the uk we fucked things up in the beginning but now we are where we are there's no way we can go back and try and rectify the wrongs and try and do things properly people are fatigued this is what it is let people open up and get back to some semblance of normal life so, yeah let's move on from that one and then we've got germany unfortunately not in a good situation at all they plan to extend uh the lockdown to march 28th so my dream or my goal of going to Bergheim somehow sometime this year is slowly but surely drifting off into the horizon which is okay you know i think that's fairly fine i think most people were under the assumption or were accepting the idea that more likely than not if you went to go to a some sort of clubbing experience you're most likely going to have to um you know do it locally i think that's kind of the the move at the moment although some of the venues and lineups i've seen lately of the festivals being announced and the club nights and shit have contained a lot of people that are coming from the eu so although there's a lot of people saying that you know it's going to be a change in the scene people are going to be a bit more local da, 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 da. most of the promoters aren't taking any chances they're still booking the people that they know can sell tickets so <laughs> if you thought that utopia was going to be a reality i am um, uh, sad to say that that is not the truth but anyway this is dw news um, it says the following Germany's national government has states are set to extend the COVID-19 lockdown by three weeks to March 28th according to a draft document seen by DW Chancellor Angela Merkel and the heads of the Germany states um, will hold discussions the measures oh sorry will discuss will hold discussions the measures on wednesday oh, oh okay we'll hold discussion on the measures on wednesday um, merkel and the state premiers are working on a draft agreement um that allows shops to reopen in areas where the numbers of coronavirus infections is considered reasonably low coronavirus cases could have fallen to a seven average seven day average of 35 per 100,000 people some outlets such as florist book and gardening shops will be able to reopen even if rates were higher so they're trying to do whatever they can to reopen some bits close some bits like it's just a maddening thing according to the draft uh, text up to five adults from two households will be allowed to gather from march 8th with up to 10 adults allowed in areas with low infection rates under the current rules each household can only socialize with one other person it must be lonely as fucking berlin right now man and i've seen i think i actually saw an article the other day from ex berliner that really good site that's talking about people especially millennials really suffering because again you have to imagine right i've, I've i don't live in berlin i've been there a few times 
and I know it's a very young city a lot of people go there to go make their dreams happen because it's a cheap place you know um, there's loads of government subsidies and all this sort of good shit set up in order for you to go and kind of you know frolic around and live your best creative life but when the entire world freezes over and you know the, you're at a standstill and there's no avenue for you to express your creativity in order for you to keep a light over your head and in general too forget light of your head because I imagine you know the pay isn't the best it's just more so the fulfillment and the the fulfillment that it kind of gives you right going to those kind of places and pursuing your dreams now to have it all on pause especially the amount of plans people had for the summer and you know especially even previous to last year as well and all the open air stuff it must be brutal at the moment and i would imagine as it's always like this right but I'd imagine in places where it's really hyper social right and hyper extroverted people who exist i also imagine it must be a part of that city that if you don't have any friends and you don't not that not that social it can be a very lonely place to be too and it could always feel like things are occurring around you but you're never invited or you're never involved so yeah my my heart goes out to people that are on their own out there in berlin at the moment with not many friends or family members it must be difficult um the German government is also the sorry. The German government is also expected to appeal to citizens to avoid domestic and foreign travel over the Easter period. Oh yeah, because you know Germans um, love to escape their country over Easter and go to anywhere else but their country somewhere out somewhere in spain whatever it may be so there might be a lot of them in spain actually because you know um spain has opened up and decided to allow other people from europe to come in um hairdressers in germany reopened business on monday so at least you can get a trim that's good along with hardware stores and flower shops in certain states so that's good so at least you, you know you can brighten up your day get a trim buy yourself some nice flowers for the home keep it moving the draft document um cited the vaccine drive and the arrival of mass rapid antigen tests as justification for the easing of the science measures it said germany will provide at least one free test a week to pupils and teachers in schools um, companies may also be required to offer tests to staff according to the proposal Oof. but yeah hopefully you guys are okay keep your head up out there if you're in germany keep your head up moving on from that one what else do we have here um but, 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 but. oh yeah the, this is um i think i mentioned this previously right did i mention this previously no let's miss skip that i've already done that it doesn't matter about that one let's skip that one du, 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 du. let's skip that oh yes go to this one this is the major news of the week isn't it so um as most of you are aware you know i've been in i i said i've been an avid or i've kind of i'm a i'm a semi-retired sneakerhead i'd say for that regard right i don't count myself as a sneakerhead because i think labels are gay and also i think sneakers can be a little bit cringe especially the stereotypical you know your whole house looks like a flipping you know supreme web store thing it can be a bit annoying with your babe duvet covers just a bit cringe but in general of course you know i've been following that shit buying that shit for years and years and years and um as i've kind of grown older and stuff and kind of had more you know disposable income and but then i've also kind of unfortunately uh pulled far and pulled more away from the actual subculture itself in terms of going to events hanging out stores uh sneaker releases uh panel discussions all that stuff right i'm not really involved as i was prior prior so it's kind of removed me from having the ability to have connections and to have plugs to able to to enable me to get the shoes that i want so i'm now having to buy shoes like a regular civilian for the last what five or so years that's been one of the things i've not really had anybody been able to kind of hook me up with anything which is fine because again i'm not one that kind of goes out and ask for stuff but it's really kind of um highlighted to me the issue and the real and the real problem when it comes to buying limited edition shoes right it's just very difficult um and i just don't think it's fair and i just don't think it makes any sense when you consider how big the industry is now the market it's a billion dollar uh, market for sure um there's you know a million brands competing for the same dollar from the same sneaker heads it's the same models getting retro year in year after year um and for the most part, nothing has really changed in terms of the ability for regular people like you and I to get a pair of these shoes. Um, we have stuff like Sneaker App, which is a whole dub, and we have various websites doing their own little um, 
routes in order to get people to buy the shoes and you know doing raffles all this kind of stuff which i'm obviously against i always think this idea that you have money and you have to win a chance to buy a pair of shoes is flipping insane they've they've effectively um redefined what the term raffle means it's sort of equivalent to when the english dictionary had to kind of redefine the term um literally because people were using it in the wrong way so it's same it feels the same things happen with the term raffle raffle used to mean you, you'd win something for free and now raffle means you get the chance to buy something with your hard-earned money and you also have to enter at a specific time case in point the sneakers app if you don't enter to buy the shoe at a particular time um then you don't get even a chance to even to get involved in the raffle it's just a whole lot of nonsense and of course with all that stuff going on with computers and internet shit it's always prime for exploitation it's prime for scamming and this has been occurring for a long time don't get me wrong right when i used to work in a sneaker store i worked in 1948 um there was a really you know popular sneaker store here in london sorry 1948 1949 1949 49, whatever it's called 1949 yeah 1949 yeah i'm um, in shoreditch I was one of the first group of staff that was working there. I worked there for about, what, four or so years. Great time. I had kind of, I'd got like an inside look into how that shit goes. And, you know, I was lucky enough to buy, you know, the first Nike Yeezys and shit and, you know, put them on lay away. I got, ended up getting four pairs and stuff. So I've had a good time. Don't get me wrong. I'm not moaning and shit, but I also saw how scummy it could get, especially towards the end when stuff changed and there was a new lead. There was a new kind of head of energy marketing at the time. And that person came through and wanted their own vision and you know your access to stuff kind of changed yeah, in the shop floor and we don't sell ourselves so that kind of affected stuff and then we had people coming in who were obviously very selfish wanted to look after themselves and then you just were ended up in a position where you were kind of fighting to get pairs as a staff member work or at the time we were registered contractors but imagine we were working for nike and it was still difficult for us to get our own pairs really really hard to get don't um ever get it twisted it, obviously my access was far better than it is now but it was still difficult to get shoes you had to really kind of fight and hustle for yourself to make it work and again back then shoes weren't as you know lucrative as they are now so you know now with greed and resale prices people will do just about anything to fuck you over so it's just you know a whole complete shit show but what it's going on now at the moment with backdooring and with people botting sites it's just way overboard it's just a nonsense and again i don't blame the bottles or the resellers it's mostly a fugazi scammy operation that really kind of stems from the brands themselves the retail stores and the distribution networks those are the people that are at fault not the resellers not the little spotty 16 year olds that are buying up a million pairs of yeezys it's the place where those shoes are actually coming from which is why in recent weeks i've been very um stern in my position that i've kind of refused to take part in that game i buy my grs and my normal shit that i can get a hold of which is fine i think going forward i think it has allowed me to maybe re kind of ignite my love for shoes because i'm now buying stuff you know on sale i'm buying stuff for, you know some grs from footlocker from jd sports and shit but in terms of buying limited edition shoes i have refused to take part in that shit show if i don't get a shoe i don't get the ability to to be able to buy it on the raffle then i'm just gonna go straight to the rep fam community find out the best link find out the best batch of the shoe and just buy it there because I, I i've had enough like i'm a grown adult i don't need to be going jumping through hoops and you know playing games tagging friends resharing of posts on instagram resharing something on twitter just have a chance to buy shoes go f yourself and then my point was drummed home even more so via this really amazing article via bloomberg news that was doing the rounds um obviously across the interwebs that basically exposed the whole sham affair because one of these kids one of these reselling kids happened to be the son of a very high-ranking nike um executive who was using his mom's card access whatever it may be to get a pair uh, get a hold of shoes and then resell them on a resale market making a killing and of course that's just conflict of interest you know um whatever it may be which effectively led to her res resignation but this is what basically you're having to fight against when you want a pair when you just buy want to buy a pair of standard yeezy 350s right this is what you're fighting against this nonsense so this is a really great article from bloomberg it says sneakerheads have turned jordans and yeezys into a bona fide asset class it's written by joshua hunt so we're gonna go straight and go and flick and kind of find out who the kid is right there's herbert right we're just gonna go through all the links that say to do with him on the actual article so opening uh, paragraph says last july joe herbert 
um, Hebert, sorry, woke up early and drove to a small warehouse um, he leased in Eugene, Oregon, um, the track obsessed college town where Nike Inc. was born. So a kid that flipping lives right next to flipping. Oh, honestly, I hate all this shit. I hate it so much. I hate it. I hate it. He was expecting an important delivery. 600 pairs of Yeezy Boost 350s um, Zion sneakers released by Adidas 12 days earlier. They sold out within hours and now commanded more than £100 above retail on the secondary market. Many sneakerheads would have felt lucky to snag a single pair of one of the world's most sought after styles adas ag products uh produces sorry just forty thousand pairs of yeezys each release which um are priced at 220 on retail sold through the yeezy supply website using a digital lottery when his shoes arrived the 19 year old who's best known to his customers as west coast joe stacked the hundreds of boxes of pairs of shoes in like poker chips on the on a sun pi- um pavement outside his warehouse it said he says quote it's easy to get a lot of styles and they are pretty much always sell um, he said one in a series of conversations we had last year about his business and um, what herbert meant by easy was this the day those Yeezys were released um he'd woken up at 3 a.m signed on the message uh messaging platform discord and rousted 50 members of his cook group a term sneaker sellers um used to describe their allies in the arbitrage when the shoes went on sale uh, an hour later herbert's team um, swarmed the Yeezy supply website using their specialized computer programs such as Cybersol, Kodai, um, GaneshBot, each prepped with Herbert's credit card information and capable gaming system. By 6 a.m., the shoes were sold out and Herbert's boss had run up 132,000 on his American Express. No, actually, here's his mum's. Um, his company, Westside, West Coast Streetwear, resold the shoes in almost as little as time as it had taken for him to buy them, clearing 20,000 in profit. Again, this isn't like trophy room jordan ones these are still just standard yeezys that come out every single year <clears throat> and look how much money they're making on them insane <clears throat> and again limiting the amount that are available for regular partners to make I'm, I'm not i'm not against resellers i've resold a bunch of shoes myself right when you're young and you want to make some money this is the best way to do it outside of selling drugs i get it but God almighty, man, the way they sort of just siphon off and absolutely scoop up every every bit of Philippine inventory out there so that regular folks like you and I can't buy them is absolutely nutty. Um, da, 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 I'm go- what does it say? Um, anything that's releasing that I know I can make a guaranteed buck on, I'm going to go into it. So we continue, right? Let's just see what else he said. Uh, da, 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 hebe, hebe, hebe. We continue on. Uh, the sneaker boom has created opportunities. It said here, um, Hebert and other young resellers um, first treat um, footwear as a bona fide asset class products as a worthy of informed valuation. The sneaker market for them is a lot like playing the market in the hours after um, a siphoning up the stock of retailers. They essentially sell short term futures based on the street. Um, sentiment by the time the prices plateau ultra rare shoes such as the jordan a1 og dior a collaboration between nike and the parisian fashion brand have become grails worth up to ten thousand pound ten thousand dollars and more we continue um he said Foot Locker was panicking and a lot of small boutiques were panicking doing 50 percent of sales have said i was just trying to uh, just trying to dump all the stuff shoppers avoiding stores and flocking instead to e-commerce platforms such as StockX, where young entrepreneurs like him were offering dead stock fucking cunt um city i remember the time the stimulus checks hit my strip my sales trip would have said in may he did 600 pounds so imagine this little privileged asshole is kind of um exploiting and fleecing people who are to, using their stimulus check which they probably shouldn't be using to buy some shoes in order to kind of get some short-term happiness and joy in the flipping bleak world that we live in living around covid you couldn't write this in it you really couldn't write this um says so here Herbert's um reselling career started in high school when he noticed that some supreme t-shirts he owned were going online for two or three times hundreds where he paid the margin traced at least partly down to the 2016 launch of, of StockX, where limited edition releases from supreme off and palace and other fuck palace by the way other streetwear brands were finding a new um it continues to see when herbert began selling shoes 2017 StockX had gone from pros- processing hundreds of transactions per day to tens of thousands demand was surging for desktop sneakers absolutely nutty you continue here 
da, da, da. Um, the move forward online sales are boom for resellers like Herbert, who could use bots to note to, to target the most sought after sneakers and acquire them in far greater quantities than customers could in the days of lining up outside stores. Um, he and his peers operate instead in digital spaces like Nike Sneakers app, which the company made as a first place and sometimes the only place people could get certain limited apps. The app executively, effectively uh, gamified the Nike's engineer scarcity model, making the experience of buying shoes like spinning a digital roulette wheel fucking hell man look at these scummy guys herbert score as a young uh shoes protect look at these people man um january 28 2020 he just dropped out of university of oregon midway through his second term um there he's racked up there he there he said he tracked down a man he'd heard about who stumbled across an exceptional find of abandoned storage unit and like he mags a futuristic duh, duh, duh. let's continue of the bit that obviously exposed him let's go down and uh, the, the, the Instagram following Herbert's competitors have access to the same bot software StockX. <clears throat> yes, Herbert did kind of talk about his sources information, but he did say that he was lucky to have grown up in Portland, where Nike and Adidas were uh, based their US operations. He said, if you know the right people, this is a city to sell shoes, the flipping cunt. The right people can give you access to stuff like a normal person would not have access to. What, like your mum and her network? These people, man, horrible. It continues. When COVID digital boom could um, got so when the COVID digital boom got underway last year, Herbert found himself confronting the unexpected problem of having more customers than ever, but way of but no way of getting his hands on more kicks. For inspiration, he looked to co-founder and Phil Knight. Oh, God Almighty, um, Herbert's traveling companion was Justin Telefero. Um, some of the best um, sources, according to Herbert, came from the kinds of restrictive uh, purchasing limits. Let's continue here. Herbert had spent more than two hundred thousand on about two thousand pairs of shoes, which he hoped would return a profit of fifty thousand. Let's continue. Where's a bit where it's saying? I'm not looking on high mud. <coughs> yeah, it's here. Um, <coughs> So this is a bit that exposed him, right? This flipping kid. One is sort of dumb dumb. He ends up getting his mum fired from her job. He said he was also taking steps to go beyond selling shoes, which I learned quite by accident ran in his blood. At one point in late June after his trip, he phoned me and the number was identified as belonging to Anne Herbert. Right? I looked up the name and discovered that Anne Herbert, who worked at Nike for 25 years, right? 25 years i'd imagine she's probably not a sneakerhead just a really amazing c-suite executive who probably worked her way up you know tooth and clawed her way up to the higher rungs of nike probably had to do many many unnecessary meetings you know late nights in this in the office uh many powerpoint presentations just to get that job right i'm assuming she's just like a regular woman who happens to be really good at what she does and nike eventually rewarded her and then her son her clout chasing, um, fame obsessed, flipping, reselling idiot of a son who probably could just enjoy his mum's riches and live very comfortably off of whatever his mum makes and whatever he also had access to, took the piss and now ends up kind of costing her a job. Honestly, terrible, terrible. Um, looked at the name 25 years of um she worked at nike for 25 years and had recently been made as vice president and general manager of north america the press release announcing her promotion noted that she would be instrumental in accelerating our consumer direct offense which what do you think that is what do you think that means um the nike initiative that helped fuel the sneaker resale boom Herbert later sent me a statement from an american express corporate card for wclcc to demonstrate west coast street where revenue and it was an and name even the company the lcc that he made maybe it's because of american laws he put it in his mom's name he's buying shoes on his mom's credit card calling people from his mom's phone and also putting the lcc in his mom's name this guy is a fucking idiot um when i asked Hebert about the connection like last year he acknowledged that Anne was his mother and said that while she had inspired him as a business person she was so high up at nike as to removed how does that even make sense how can she be so high up that she's removed you idiot um as removed of what she does and what she never received any type of information he instead though um he insisted though that she was not be mentioned in the article and cut contact off no longer uh, not long after our conversation and Hebert didn't reply to the email questions uh carry on john the nike sportswear spokesperson says and disclosed relevant information about wc and nike in 2018 there was no violation of company policy privileged information or conflicts of interest nor is there any commercial affiliation between um whatever his thing is and nike including direct buying or reselling of the nike products so again this exposes the fact that 
or at least cast this aspersion on this idea because people could always think, oh, how does this always happen? Because these brands are in bed with the resellers. Some Think about it. All of these people that you're seeing with stacks of shoes, full-size runs that you'd find in stores, sometimes even better stock that you'd actually get from an actual retail store, how do they get a hold of it? It's because these brands, these retail distribution networks and these stores are in cahoots with the resellers. They are fixed the game. The game is fixed. The game is rigged then don't want you to actually have the shoes. They limit the stock on purpose. It's artificial scarcity for the sake of it, which is why I'm rep firm for life. It continues. Um, Nike's marketing and corporate culture are strong enough in Portland that anyone there can steep in it. The children of the company executive, no doubt even more so, but whatever advantages of growing up with the silver swoosh in his mouth, Herbert's hustle couldn't be denied. Ah, fuck him and his hustle. So that's what happened. And then look at the development. Look at the development. This is courtesy of Complex News. Nike VP resigns after family tied sneaker reseller is uncovered. Courtesy of Complex, right? Absolutely disgusting. Um, so this is a statement here. It said, um, Nike and Herbert, of course, that boy's mum, a Nike employee of 25 years who most recently served as a VP overseeing North American business, left the company on Monday. So again, white privilege. She was not fired for her flipping disastrous and conflicting um, business practices and allowing her son to use her corporate card, or whatever it is, and access of information to go and acquire shoes. Allegedly, she was allowed and given a permission to step down. Now again, maybe it's because effectively she, like I imagine, she was probably just a mum who happened to be really good, professional at her job, and she de definitely had no idea what her son was doing, but still. This is ridiculous, isn't it? Um, it says here, a quote from Nike, and Hebert VP GM North America Geography has decided to step down from Nike effectively immediately. The email reads, we thank Anne for more than 25 years of Nike and wish her well. And if you know anything about Nike, I worked in 1948, right? They booted us out quickly. But if you know anything about Nike, you'd know that people don't leave their jobs. That's probably why it's hard to get hired there right people don't leave it's like a dream job they treat you well they pay you well um you know why else would you want to leave they give you the opportunity to basically do your best work so the fact that she stepped down is a real real big indication that something fugazi was going on for sure like he also put out a press release this afternoon publicly announcing the end of the tenure confirmed the move in a statement to complex he said and herbert made a decision to resign from nike the brand said herbert's living comes days after the publication of bloomberg peace focus on her son a 19 year old sneakerhead and so Name Joe, Joe, what an idiot! The piece mentioned the credit card Joe used to resell in the uh, business West Coast Streetwear that was registered in Nan's name. The reseller insisted that the story's author and personal connection with his Nike said not be written up, and the communication was cut off when it was brought up. Man, but like I said, man, the game is rigged. The game is absolutely rigged. They don't want you to win, and this is definitely proof of it. But again, I'm glad that. There are people out there now because, you know, the bigger the sneaker community gets, the bigger the sneaker industry gets, you're going to get these people who kind of turn into, you know, quasi sneaker and streetwear journalists who dig deep and find out these kind of nefarious ideas and things that are going on. Because I would have, again, if I was in tune with the community like I was back in the day, I would have heard about this in the queue. I would have found out through some whispers going around, but you can never prove this sort of shit. But now that, the again, the sneaker community is a billion dollar, sneaker industry is a billion dollar market. Um, there's just way too many people involved now people are everyone's making a check from the sneaker influencers to the people doing unboxing videos on youtube it's only natural now that there's going to be a whole breed of sneaker in, investigative journalists who are going to come out and just uncover all this stuff and just blow up all these miscom you know blow up all these um blow up the entire industry and expose it for exactly what it is and i'm here for it i am here for it next on the list what else do we have here we have this flipping crazy story, courtesy of New York Times. Governor Cuomo, man, uh, horny, horny Cuomo. If he's not out there, you know, um, sticking old people into, sticking old people with COVID into old people's home and, you know, effectively killing hundreds, if not thousands of them, he's out there sexually harassing allegedly aides that work with him. This is just a terrible state of affairs. And again, such a um, fall from grace from somebody who just earlier was producing, did he, did he write a book about how well he was dealing with COVID and now he's in a position where he's essentially being um, removed from office or kind of his influence is somehow dwindling his star is dimming because of these heinous accusations that have been kind of uh, placed against him. This courtesy of New York Times, it says, sexual harassment claims against Cuomo, what we know so far. Um, 
it says here uh let's screen this um governor cuomo is confronting one of the most tumultuous moments of the of, of the three terms in office after two women who once worked with his administration accused him of sexually harassing them under the intense public and political pressure the governor's office asks the state attorney governor to appoint someone to conduct an outside investigation into sexual harassment claims against governor cuomo a democrat on sunday evening mr cuomo issued an apology of sorts right saying Again, this is this is when you know you're a piece of shit. Um, I acknowledge some of the things I have said and um, been misinterpreted as unwanted flirtation. To the extent anyone felt um, a way that way, I'm truly sorry. So if you did feel like I offended you, if you did feel like I unnecessarily touched you up, then I'm sorry like jesus christ and on monday a third woman described an unwanted advance from the governor at a wedding prompting several democrats to call on the governor to resign the deepening scandal marks one of the lowest points of mr cuomo's tenure as thrust the political future into uncertainty as he faces renewed scrutiny of his administration decision to withhold data on the nursing home deaths um, during the pandemic but it's funny to, to see that somehow um the, again this is not it is not my judgment it just is what it is it's interesting that the lives of these three women or their you know their experience you know at the hands of governor cuomo is far more important than the deaths of hundreds if not thousands of old people in old people's homes um during covid right because none of this kind of heat was at him when you know when it was obviously uncovered that he might have done something nefarious uh relating to nursing homes whatever it may be and the numbers were fudged nothing really happened really he kind of rid that out and kind of kept it moving but the moment these free um angel looking um, women who worked alongside him direct you know contact with the guy came out and said he's a creep he said some untowards thing to me and again from what we can see so far there's been nothing uh past saying from what again i'm not like, reading into it but i think it's there's been nothing physically like you know no like you know rape or anything it's just been obviously unprofessional and um you know stuff that you probably shouldn't be doing to your aid especially in the position of power that he has but still isn't it mad to think like you know the lives of thousands of old people is not that important right to bring down a, polit a politician who is kind of framing himself up to be the covid savior of new york instead these three women come out and immediately everything stops right immediately people are like on you know on call and, and paying attention to everything going on so it says the ex aide the first lady here it says christian bennett a 25 year old former aide of the governor accused um him of sexually harassing her la last year when she was 24 how old is he is he at 63 jesus christ this is terrible 63 had asked her about her sex life and whether she had ever had sex with older men come on bruv this is creep 101 behavior miss bennett who left the administration in november described one instance in which when she was alone with the governor in his state capital office mr cuomo asked if her if she thought age made a difference in romantic relationships remarks she took as overtures of sexual relationships now this is precisely one of those power dynamic things because sometimes the power dynamic can get a bit annoying people describing it they can sometimes conflate the issue and overuse the term but this is not um this is not kosher man like if you're a governor of cuomo's stature and you're somebody that it feels like he was kind of you know putting his hat in the ring and trying to demonstrate how good he was at politics and governing so he could eventually maybe run for president one time i don't know but whatever it may be he's a big deal right and i imagine being the mayor being a governor of new york it probably lends to a lot of political influence and you know he probably has a lot of clout a lot of connections and you know how he goes on the italian he kind of acts like a bit like a quasi mob boss anyway which is really bizarre him and his brother so you can only imagine the the kind of fear and intimidation that he kind of demands from the staff whenever he walks around i can imagine him walking through the corridor people kind of you know freeze up and they don't want to speak about certain things so just imagine how horrible it must be for a young woman 24 years old right you're inexperienced you're coming into politics you're wide-eyed naive thinking you're gonna make a change all this sort of stuff and you're looking up to this guy he's a charismatic dude right leading the thing he's probably introduced you to his wife he's showing a picture of his family and then suddenly he's asking you whether or not you flipping shagged older men like maddening man maddening um then it continues here i don't know what did she say uh da, da, da. oh sorry mr yeah uh, miss bennett said that she reported the incident to the governor with the governor sorry to his chief of staff and was transferred to another job right similar to what they do in the catholic church instead of addressing the issue they just transferred her somewhere else uh disgusting she also provided a lengthy statement about the episode to a special counsel of the to the governor the times corroborated miss bennett's account through interviews with friends family members she told 
about the incidents at the time and the review of the contemporaries um contra what's it what's that how do you say that word Conto contemporaneous text messages and emails in a statement on saturday mr Cuomo described miss bennett as a hard-working and valued member of his staff and said he respected her right to speak out <laughs> i thought he's gonna say something else i was gonna say that bitch is a liar i thought he's gonna say that he said i've never made advances towards the bennett nor did i ever intend to act in a way that was inappropriate very clever wording i never made advances because technically just saying that isn't an advance it's sort of like a um it's sort of like a weirdly rhetorical question, but you know where you're getting at, isn't it? So I get where he's trying to be a bit clever there, but you know, creeps are going to creep. Um, but also, isn't it funny the timing of all this? I wonder if this is kind of um, what's that word called? Um, when you're sort of trying to protect your own back, because it's obvious that you know, Como's star is dimming, he's most likely going to, you know, not have a he's not going to come out of this with a good report card. So if any, so if anything, most of these women probably are, you know, that association next to him, that kind of smudge and that cloud that resides over you probably isn't going to go away. People in process probably remember that sort of shit. So what better way to really distance yourself than to say, hey, that guy's a creep. He just some really feel her things to me. It could be just advantageous. It could just be a coincidence. It could just be, you know, they're going to come out now. But I find the timing really interesting. Um, but regardless, these accounts are horrible. Um, another female aide said the governor kissed me on the lips oh jesus i take back the physical stuff so something did happen miss bennett's um accusations came only a day after another former administration aide lindsey boy boyle boyle yeah boyle elaborated on the previous sexual harassment claims that she said that she had lodged against the governor miss boy boylan sorry boylan yeah boylan miss boylan had worked for the state's economic um development agency from 2015 2018 published an essay on wednesday in which she detailed several years of uncomfortable interactions oh my god miss boylan who said her boss at the time would told her that Cuomo had a crush on her quote unquote said the governor um went out of his way to touch me on my lower back arms and legs and again i bet you any money that flipping boss was a was a woman and if it was, you need to take a long, hard look at yourself for relaying that message of, of disgustingness. Um, in October 2017, during a fight, sorry, during a flight back from the event in West North New York, Miss Boylan said Mr. Como told her that he would pay play strip poker. Jesus Christ. And in 2018, she said Mr. Como gave her an unsolicited kiss after a one-on-one -on -one meeting in his Manhattan office. Oh my God. As I got up to leave and walk around to open the door, he stepped in front of me and kissed me on the lips. I was in shock, but I kept walking. The governor's office said that Miss Boylan's claim to a false and did not call for independent review of allegations. Oh my God. There's going to be so many people who are going to get buried from this. Miss Boylan, who's running for Manhattan by a president, first publicly accused of Como of the assault in December but did not specify details after miss bennett went public with accusation miss boylan called on mr como to resign his abuse of power never ends she wrote he does not get to choose his judge and jury we do that's her there mama mia a third woman recounted her unwanted advances and Rouge 33 said she encountered mr como at a party um sorry at a wedding they attended in september 2011 2019 sorry when they began talking about a toast the governor had given mr Cuomo then put his hand on her lower back again with the lower back moving and touching and shit right keep your hands to yourself my guy when he removed her hand when she removed his hand with her own the governor remarked that she seemed aggressive and that placed his hands on the cheeks and asked if she'd want to kiss miss ruth said she pulled away as the governor drew closer she said, I quote, I was so confused and shocked and embarrassed, said Miss Roosh, whose recollection was corroborated by a friend, contemporary, contemporariness, text messages and photographs from the event. I turned my head away and didn't have words. Is that the picture that everyone's floating around now where he's kind of awkwardly, creepily grabbing the what, young lady's face and she looks every like every bit like she's recoiling inside? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mrs. Roach, um, example is an ex is indistinct is distinct from the other two accusations she has never been employed by the governor or the state still her experience reinforces escalating concerns about mr Cohen's personal conduct she said it's an act of impunity that strikes me i didn't even have a choice in the matter i didn't have a choice in his physical dominance over me and that moment and that's what infuriates me and even what i could and even what i could do removing his hand from my lower back even doing that was not clear enough yeah because that's a thing in it that, that, that just must be a thing about older men 
they just have no idea no kind of concept of personal space and signs and signals and shit you're just old you know what i mean all you do is shit and fart and put on nipple rings and shit you probably have no idea how to talk to women like does he even have a wife and family too it's like god almighty brother um, relax for any politician um, including Democrats, Mrs. Rich's story proved to be the tipping point. Um, on Monday night, Representative Kathleen Rice, a, a former uh, Nusu County um, the, the district attorney, became the first Democrat in New York Congress, a delegation to call for Ms. Cuomo to resign. She said a person who treats women in this way is not fit to govern. John C. Liu, a Democrat state attorney. For, so yeah, man, it's not looking good for the guy and it? it's not looking good for him. And again, he deserves it, man, for the kind of, you know, catastrophe mm -hmm. that he's kind of dealt with um, COVID in New York. The fact that he then decided to do a U-turn and open things up the moment Trump got, you know, um, booed out of the White House, clearly showing that he politicized the entire issue at, the, you know, at the negative cost to his own citizens. And, you know, the whole thing with the nursing homes. Yeah, this is probably, this is, this is, um... This is one of those things that you say karma definitely came knocking at his door. So yeah, let's see how that transpires. Let's see how that transpires. Next on the list. Oh, we have this. This is an interesting news on the podcast self front. So I've only found this out recently. This happened a while ago, right? But I've only found out that supposedly History Arenas is done. The podcast is hosted by Yanis Pappas and Chrissy D is no more. Um, they've split up they've gone to do their own thing because I was wondering why Yanis Pappas was, keeps doing that show he does called Yanni Long Days so Yanni Yanni Long Days which is really good it's really fun um, he's got the similar sort of ranting um, style of a Tim Dillon and a Bill Burr right he's really funny um, it can get a little bit annoying and a little bit um, <laughs> hard to follow on Twitter because he goes off when, he, when he's feeling on it and he wants to talk about politics and shit. But, you know, whatever it is, I, I like his I like his brand of comedy and how he kind of conducts himself. And he's a funny dude. Um, and I was wondering innit, what was going on. And then I saw Chris D started a new podcast with that guy, Salvo Alcano. I didn't really check it out, but I just assumed it was just, you know, um, maybe on like a brief hiatus or whatever it may be. But supposedly it's completely done. And this is an article here courtesy of HITC. It says, History Hyenas, uh, History Hyenas Ending, Yanis Pappas Explains Podcast Fate on Twitter. Um, it says here, um, Yanis, um, is History Hyenas Ending and Why? Comedians Yanis Pappas and Chris Stefano Chris Di Stefano are successful in their own careers and their weekly podcast History Hyenas has become a huge hit since its launch. Sadly though, there have been rumours that the podcast is coming to an end and many fans are pretty gutted about it, me included. So is History Hyenas ending and why? Yes. Yes, History Hyenas is coming to an end. Yanis confirmed the sad news on Twitter. He said the rumours are true. History Hyenas has um, three more episodes and then it's over. I know it seems strange and sudden and I know it's sad for our fans and I want to thank the fans and you and everything and I hope to continue to enjoy Chris and Hey Bay and his other new show on true tv and more in another tweet uh chris said it's all love and teased that he and chris will ride again at some point in the future da, 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 da. so yeah man crazy considering like again like you have to remember right they had a pretty um unique and i think special podcast in terms of how it was basically done right you take a topic in history and you kind of dive on deep you uncover some you know interesting truth nuggets some interesting comedic things that they can kind of riff on and just a great way to kind of consistently keep it fresh and keep obviously the guests informed you people you sometimes you bring some guests in just do it them too it was a really really good show um i love the patreon questions that they were doing the q a's were really really amazing and the patreon was booming last time i checked it was like from what i remember it was like i think like 4k per month or something that they were making on patreon alone they'll point out loads of bonus content loads of stuff loads of communication and interaction with the fans and all this stuff like it's just really sad to see it end to be honest um it says here why is it ending yeah that's and chris had revealed that they explained why they were ending his in the podcast last episode but it's safe to say that a lot of fans are sad um one person tweeted just found out it's ending um, and I don't know what I'm going to do with myself on Wednesdays. Definitely agree. Another person said, because of his Hyenas, I got really into my favorite comedians and met some of the nicest people ever. I'm excited to see what is next for Chris and Yanis. And someone stood, I'm still legit upset about his Hyenas ending. What's next? Yanis will continue hosting his own podcast called Long Days, which is available to listen now. And moreover, will be performing at the Soldiers Comedy Club. It's, that's already gone. No, it's coming up. So on March 13th. As for Chris, he's upcoming show in Phoenix and you can find details in the show show clip. But the concerning thing about this is that it, it looks like Chrissy D is the one that initiated the breakup because he's now doing a show 
on True TV, which sounds again, I love the guys, but this this show sounds fucking terrible. Um, this is courtesy of Deadline TV. It says home renovation series Backyard Bar Wars, ordered by True TV with Chris DeStefano as host. All right, this is Chrissy D, of course. There, um, comedian Chrissy D is playing a pub landlord in the busiest at home bars on the block in a new series for True TV. Um, I'm not even sure what True TV is. Again, I'm from the UK, so I don't know. Maybe it's a pretty decent channel, but from the looks of it, it doesn't sound like one of those uh, legit channels that you would actually be chuffed to be a part of. But again, maybe I'm wrong. Um, Chrissy D is hosting a Backyard Bar Wars, a home renovation series for the Warner Media Cable network the series will pit two neighbors against each other in a backyard build-off to create their own bar based on the rising trends of diy bars the series is standalone is a send-up of the classic home reno show self um, self-described unhandy man uh christiana roasting the builders as they put up their creations like what is this like again maybe i'm not really aware of this sort of stuff but i know there's like a whole home gym scene right Maybe the whole home bar thing is a consequence of Corona and lockdown, but I've not really heard much about it. I've seen people doing mobile bars and doing bars and sheds and stuff. But for the most part, the major thing that I've been seeing at home renovations has been concerning gyms and creating studios. So the bar thing is just blows my mind. Secondly, from the entire time I've listened to History Hyenas, I don't really remember Chrissy D being a drinky guy, like being very familiar with bar culture and how to put a bar together and talking about beers and, or, you know, dark liquor and shit. He's not really that kind of dude. So I don't really know what kind of expertise he's kind of lends to this sort of thing. It doesn't really make any sense. It just sounds terrible. Like it kind of sounds like um, a worse version of like Bar Rescue. And Bar Rescue is quite formulaic, right? They just, you know, this guy comes in, he He's an expert in the hospitality industry. He identifies the pain points and the things that you're doing wrong in your restaurants, gives you a complete makeover and then, you know, hands you back your, your keys to your restaurant so you can go on making some money because you've probably been losing it and you're in debt and shit. But this sort of stuff, like, I don't, what, they're going to be competing to see who's the best bar in their garden, in their home. How do they judge what the best bar is? Who does that? Like, um, what, he's roasting the builders that are going to be working on the same bars, that the same builders that are working on every single uh, bar renovation. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, Backyard Bar comes from 44 Blue Productions, a Red Hour studio company behind Netflix, Jailbirds, a &E's, Wolpergs, <laughs> Animal Planners, Pitbulls, and Parolis. The showrunner is Renner Canozzi, who executive produced Flip and Flop Nashville and has worked on a series including the Treehouse Masters and executive produced by Stephen, Stephanie sorry, Noonan, whatever her name is there, David Hale, and Dan Snook. It will be filmed in LA, around LA, and will premiere in July 2021. Like, it just sounds terrible, man. And again, maybe it's a really interesting that somebody... It's really interesting for me as a fan, and again, me doing my own podcast, that it seems like as much as these guys like to talk about being independent and doing their own thing and all this sort of stuff, deep down, it feels like a lot of these, um, especially the high-level comedians, people that kind of want to be part of the entertainment industry, are secretly hoping for some form of validation from the industry whether it's hollywood you know the new streaming platforms hulu netflix they really want that stamp whether it's tv especially if you've grown up you know watching some of the you know more legendary shows on american television that's what they're really in for it for as much as they like to make out as if i'm happy with stand up and i'm i've got my fan base i can tour i can do my own thing on my own schedule because look fair enough this show is probably going to pay this guy guaranteed money way above what he's making even when you combine patreon but i guess part of the beauty of doing his own podcast and having you know a successful patron is that you can make your own timetable you don't you're not kind of uh, beholden to go into a studio and filming at a certain time you're free to jump on other people's shows because ever since because part of the reason i've seen especially on the subreddit people have been um saying that allegedly you know a lot of the i think archive shows or some of the other risque shows are you know un you're unable to find them i don't too sure if that's true but it does seem like he's kind of purposely trying to clean up his image you know the image the show that he's doing now with sal it they don't they don't curse or anything so he's obviously trying to get um some form of habit of making sure that he kind of is able to speak in that tv voice which makes complete sense and again he's got a young kid he's got a wife at home he's got a house mortgage, whatever it may be people have got the responsibilities to make but it's just interesting when you think about him you think about andrew's 
Schultz. Um, there's somebody else as well. Loads of people who are kind of waving the flag of independence. I'm gonna stick by my thing. Da, 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 da. Really, when the big comes, when the big guns come calling in the industry, and again, this maybe lends credence to something Whitney Cummins said recently in the podcast with Tim Dillon, and she mentioned, "Oh, all you guys that talk about independence and not coming in industry, eventually, when they come knocking and they come with an offer, you're gonna also bend the knee or kind of kiss the ring, right? Or kind of whatever it may be, right? You're gonna take that money, um, because it feels like." all of these guys secretly have always wanted to be part of the industry. Um, so this is why maybe you have to give Brian Callan credit in that respect, right? He never kind of hid his desire to be an actor, right? So he just happened to be really good at stand-up, but he really wanted to be an actor first. And the moment that kind of was going for him, he definitely didn't start abandoning the podcast. And of course, unfortunately, the situation happened with him. So everything kind of went away. But this is interesting, isn't it? Really interesting thing to see guys that are you know doing a crazy good podcast really great fan base you know probably one of the only podcasts i think from that scene that especially when you read the comments is usually you know insanely positive people really loved those guys they didn't really have a favorite they kind of had great chemistry again podcasting from what i've seen so far with people being on networks is very difficult to just make a successful podcast especially when there's two people or more than two people involved um especially when they're not friends and they happen to have a great chemistry on there they bounce off each other really well um again it was a really um interesting um you know, theme around the podcast itself in terms of, you know, two comedians, two stand-ups who, you know, profess to not know much, you know, diving deep on history, you know, really kind of showcasing their intellect and also providing some sort of comic relief. Amazing. And again, I just, this is a screenshot somebody provided about the incomes that they were making. I just, I can't really, it beggars belief how they would want to you know fumble the bag that badly but this is a screenshot talking about revenue on patreon per month and it lists here tim Dillon's show flagrant two podcast um bay ridge boys obviously that is his show Ina's, chrissy d's own and yannis pappas and if you see the, the bay ridge boys i think when they announced that they were breaking up it obviously fell off a cliff around here on the 14th of february but at their peak right they were making something close to forty thousand dollars per month on patreon that's not including what they'll make in ad revenue. That's not what including they'll make with sponsors on their podcast. Not including what they're going to make on the road, doing sh live shows and shit. They were making 40000 just telling sh dick jokes and whatever it may be. Talking about history sprinkled in here and there. Like, it's mad, man. Especially when you consider the amount they were making on page, on flipping, on the live streams and their Q&As and shit. Like, I just, I really can't understand it, man. And especially when you think, again, I, I wish Chrissy did the best, but more than likely that show's not gonna go past two seasons maybe not even one so to give that up for that is mad but again maybe again guaranteed money and if if it does end up flopping they can still go back on the drawing board and put the show back together again you know it is what it is but very interesting development there very very interesting development next on list to end we got some unfortunate news here from my guy chris delio it looks like it's maybe officially over again for him um just when he thought the coast was clear just when he thought it was a great time to come out and you know put out that apology video which i thought he did pretty well in terms of articulating you know how he's basically felt over the last year addressing some of the com accusations and allegations against him um trying his best to basically illustrate that he's a changed man and that he wants to kind of move on from this period and kind of get back to doing what he does best telling jokes and continuing on with his podcasts but i did question at the time if it if it did if it was premature or if there was a incorrect if the or if there was a correct way of kind of coming out and apologizing because as we've kind of or as i've spoken about in this podcast i'm still of a firm believer that you know the wrong way to do it is following what brian callan does i'm not sure what the right way is because again i'm not i've never been accused of something like this and i've touched wood it never does happen um but i do know the wrong way to do it is to do what brian callan did now should you be going completely silent for a year plus as Callan crystalia has done no it's not been a year plus it's been since june but however it's more than six months probably not you probably should address it head on and try your best to kind of clear your name whatever way you can people will say oh you shouldn't clear your name because it's accusation they should be the ones trying to prove you right cool safe but in the world that we live in at the moment unfortunately things have changed and you basically have to prove that you're innocent as opposed as opposed to your accuser having to prove that you're guilty it just is what it is that's the world we live in it's not fair but that is what it is now can he prove it i don't know once maybe people are kind of put off by 
trying to fight that in the courts properly because they're afraid of what else may come out of from the story and they're afraid of going up on the stand and stuff and you know court cases are long they're expensive all this shit i get it so maybe putting your head down hoping that people go away it's better to do it but again you know seeing as the amount of reputational damage this stuff does your best your best bet is to kind of address it in some meaningful way when it happens as opposed to kind of laying low and now that Chris D has kind of popped his head out from underneath the parapet. Um, another lady has now come out courtesy of TMZ and basically accused Chris D'Elia of stealing, his virg stealing her virginity. It's the headline series the following. Chris D'Elia sued, right? You stole my virginity at 17 and called it hot comedian denies allegations. And I think this might be the first person that's actually put together an actual lawsuit against him. So this is mad, isn't it? Just the day after um, that he, or a couple of days after when he put out his apology or his kind of explanation, I'm back video. So it says the following. Chris Aaliyah had sex with a 17 year old high school student. And she says when she told him his uh, age, he said it was hot according to a new lawsuit and Chris denies the allegation. Jesus Christ, man the comedian is being sued by jane doe for allegedly of course it's um uh, uh okay continue sorry about that go back again the comedian is being sued by jane doe for allegedly violating federal sex child sexual exploitation and child pornography laws she is not suing because the two allegedly had sex when they met in connecticut the age of consent is 16 she's what she's doing for then allegedly violating federal sexual exploitation and child okay cool in the docs obtained by tmz chris alleged victim claims that she communicated with the star of a social media in 2014 when she was just 17 and he quickly started demanding nudes when she uh, she says two months later he invited her to his hotel room before one of his shows uh where they had sex yikes man yikes uh, the woman claims Crystal Lear demanded eye contact when they had sex and says that when she told him she was 17 and still in school, Chris responded by saying it was hot. Oh my God. And you know what makes this even worse, right? Because his whole press run, re rehabilitation thing, which is, you know, maybe a, a bit exploitative and manipulative, has been to post images and videos of him with his son, who's super cute. But this is not, in, you know, when you put these accusations alongside videos of his kid and his diaper, you're like, and him calling a 17-year-old hot, you're just like, God almighty, Chris, mate. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As you know, Chris recently got emotional addressing allegations that he was grooming underage girls online and allegedly exposing himself to several women saying um, sex controlled his life. A spokesperson, for, a spokesperson for Chris in addressing the lawsuit tells us that Chris denies the allegation and will vigorously defend himself against them in court. Good. According to the docs, the girl says she was a virgin before having sex with Chris, who also asked her to send him pornographic videos of her having sex with other boys her age. Oh my gosh. She also claims that he asked her to meet and have sex with his friends. Years after the alleged hotel encounter, the woman claims that she was disturbed to see Chris' character in Netflix U as he plays comic who preys on underage girls. She's suing Chris for damages, asking the judge to stop him from possessing or taking any action regarding the alleged pornographic images of her oh my god it's a wrap for the like how are you meant to, again even if this is even if this is a false accusation how can you effectively fight this like i just don't see it like what do, do you have proof that you can show that you didn't have any contact with this person and that she made up all the screenshots because i'm sure you know if this is going this far i would assume she's put together some evidence presented it to some lawyer who thinks that he's got a case enough to go to court again it could be incorrect maybe the lawyer is just taking it on because he knows chris has got a lot of heat on his name and if he takes it to court somebody of his stature won't want to it, it to be a long drawn out process so he's maybe settling outside of court but this is mad isn't it this also may explain why people just say you shouldn't come out and address stuff why it's better just to kind of hide underneath because I'm, I, I wonder if this lawsuit would have ever come to light if he didn't apologize maybe it was always gonna be a thing and they were putting the papers through and maybe with covid you know it takes long to you know uh put court cases together i'm not too sure but i wonder if this is a direct consequence of him putting out his head up the parapet that someone will want to come and snipe because it is quite advantageous right if somebody is on the ropes and they're really nervous about making a comeback and they make a video 
and then you have an allegation that's you know a bit a bit airy fairy but you have one this is the perfect time to snipe because they're so worried about getting their career restarted that they're willing to just do anything just settle just to kind of get you to show up so they can get back on stage but this is wild man it just doesn't end in it it's just mad it doesn't end again it should be a wake-up call for everybody in the, in the comedy industry um in general for when stuff does reopen there needs to be a real root and stem analysis as to how these guys conduct themselves around women and around fans and shit because part of me just can't understand why some of these guys that have access to all these adoring fans late at night and people's in in inhibitions are a bit you know loose and whatever it may be why they will specifically go down this route of touching up little kids or you know trying to hook up with girls that are clearly you know bordering on the line of underage i get it you know most men like younger girls and shit but just for self-preservation stuff won't you want to just i don't know hook up with a couple of mills hook up with people a bit your your age whatever it may be like does it really need to be adolescence like does it really need to is that what you that is that what can drive you i guess it's different for him maybe because he's allegedly got some sexual addiction or whatever it may be but even with that usually if you've read um um russell brand's book and he talks about his sexual addiction it was more so about just getting his beak wet regardless it didn't matter who the person was a granny you know somebody his age whatever it may be he was just went to you know he was just an animal at that at that stage and his addiction was just taking over every part of his life but this seems like an odd addiction isn't it it just seems like addiction that's only kind of um that's only kind of reserved for girls that happen to occupy the ages between allegedly again between the ages of like 17 and 24 it's just a very odd sort of um approach but yeah man god damn it this does not look well and again what do you do now and if you're a friend that came out and supported the guy in your industry do you come out and support this again do you stand behind him when this other allegation this is like this is mad and again considering the amount of time these guys have been out of business not being able to earn money on the stage the last thing you want to do is be cancelled just to for standing next to somebody who you think might be innocent in it so some of this some of the stuff that i was getting upset about these comedians not standing up for their friends now i get it i totally get it man like this is a lot this is a lot <laughs> this is a lot there's like so many flipping bodies so many flipping victims allegedly again we don't know if they're true or not but it seems like like this guy was getting it in man like god damn it chris Alia, relax he was get like no like I, I just don't get it again maybe it's just maybe it's something psychological about the access when you when you had everything your age up and maybe within your age range the only logical step is to go down in it right and just and then well, as you go down it gets more risky and that kind of uh gets your blood flowing right um some way in some odd sadistic way in some noncy way right that kind of gets you going i don't know but i just don't understand it, it doesn't make any sense because most again i'll imagine the majority he's in a unique position like i keep saying because he's a fine star and he's popular with kids and shit but i would imagine a lot or the majority of women that go to comedy clubs and to go watch comedians tell dick jokes at flipping 10 p.m at night are usually women of age so the fact that you purposely go and kind of you know um as young as you uh, as young as maybe legally uh permitted is just asking for trouble and now look now look man it's just like fuck me My entire career ruined because you're just too horny it's just madness isn't it again madness 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 but again let me know what you think in the comments down below do you think chris is guilty do you think this girl is out for clout um do you think his career is over do you expect uh brian callen and oh sorry do you expect brendan short to come and say anything on these podcasts again and say uh, if you bring evidence if you've got a court case if you've got allegations if you've got charges if you've got charges do you expect him to say anything let me know in the comments down below i'm interested to know your opinions on the issue let me know in the comments down below Anyway, that was the Agassino Zinger Show, episode number 438. Thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, it's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button down below. Hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. And of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. Until next time, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care and be safe. Peace.